Hello, and welcome to today's episode of the Safe Schools Rainbow Roundtable. I'm Francesca D'Amore, the Board Secretary of Safe Schools, and it's a pleasure to have you join us. The Rainbow Roundtable is unique in America to explore the student and youth LGBTQ plus experience. Today, we delve into a topic close to our hearts and critical to our ongoing dialogue about inclusion, equality, and understanding the transgender experience. From the vibrant visibility of transgender and non-binary individuals in the media, to the historic recognition of Transgender Day of Visibility by the White House, we've witnessed monumental steps towards acceptance and understanding. Yet, juxtaposed against this progress, we find a landscape marred by legislative efforts aimed at eroding the rights and dignities of our transgender siblings. Today, we stand at a crossroads between celebration of authenticity and the challenges of existing in a world that often resists change. This evening, we're not just sharing stories or statistics. We're igniting a conversation about the real lived experiences of transgender and non-binary people especially our youth, against the backdrop of an evolving society that both embraces and also challenges their journey towards living as their authentic selves. We'll explore the joy, the resilience, and the undeniable spirit of the community, alongside the sobering reality of anti-trans legislation sweeping across states like Florida, and what it means for the future of LGBTQ rights and well-being. Joining us? are a panel of remarkable individuals, each bringing their unique perspective and expertise to today's discussion. Let's welcome Vaughn Sellers. She studies theater at Barry University and is a social media influence and cheer coach. Welcome, Vaughn. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Vaughn. I am a 21-year-old trans woman. Um, I am a cheer coach. Um, <sighs> such a headache um i also i started studying theater and social work at Barry university i will be transferring to fiu in the summer um and i'm happy to be here today to share my experiences you know every voice matters and i'm happy to be here awesome next let's welcome mateo ventura brewer mateo is the first trans executive director of the largest nonprofit lgbtq plus women's organization in florida the aqua foundation for women welcome mateo thank you it's a pleasure to be here and uh, just make sure you get your tickets for our totally free um, lgbtq plus family barbecue that's happening on sunday march 3rd in historic virginia key beach it's going to be a lot of fun we're going to have water slides activities for the kids as well as food and um, a dj so Awesome. Next, let's welcome June Raven Romero. She is a well-known actress here in South Florida. Hi, and welcome, June. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to get into the conversation if it's something I can do well and speak um, at length. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm starring in a one-woman show. It's an immersive show put on by Juggernaut Theater Company, who is the immersive leader in the southeastern region of the United States, really. Um, they put on compelling, beautiful, exciting work. And the show is essentially about an Elvis fan club fanatic. Next, let's welcome Brianna Bree Benz. She currently sits as an advisory board member for the prestigious Miami-Dade LGBTQIA plus advisory board. Well, welcome, Bree. Hi. Yes. Um, yeah, my name is Bree. Um, I actually was born in 1961, so I'm probably the oldest person here on the panel. Um, lots of experience, historical experience, I think I can add to this. Um, I don't have anything I'm promoting. I'm just grateful to be here and pleasure to meet everybody. I'm right there with you with the experience. So, yeah. <laughs> And now let's welcome Taya Herlin, the Director of Public Relations for Reflect Collective. Welcome. Hi, guys. Um, so I'm really excited. Um, about what we have at Reflect this year. We're going to do Queer Fest pretty soon, so follow our social media for more information. And I'm Taya. I'm also a college student. I'm 24, just turned 24. Oh my God, that's crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I study women and gender studies. I'm going to be doing a social work master's. You're awesome.
In this segment, we will share and reflect on the real life experiences of transgender and non-binary youth. Their journeys, filled with profound joy and significant challenges, offer us invaluable insights into the resilience required to live authentically in a society still learning to embrace diversity. Imagine being a young child, feeling distinct from your peers, knowing in your heart that your true self doesn't align with the expectations set by society. These feelings aren't new or a trend, but a fundamental aspect of one's identity, as real and undeniable as the color of one's eyes. For many, the journey to understanding and articulating their gender identity is a path filled with self-discovery, challenges, and ultimately, hmm, liberation. From the stories of those who, meeting other transgender or non-binary individuals, found the words to describe their feelings for the very first time to the experience of those who embraced terms like gender queer, gender fluid, or simply queer. These narratives are as diverse as humanity itself. Gender identity does not exist in a vacuum. It intersects with race, culture, religion, and socioeconomic class, shaping and being shaped by the broader facets of an individual's life. For some, this intersectionality enriches their identity, while for others, it presents additional layers of complexity and challenge. Navigating the world while holding these truths can be daunting. Deciding when and how to disclose one's gender identity involves a constant calculation of safety and authenticity, especially in environments that may not be welcoming or understanding. Yet, in the face of these challenges, transgender and non-binary youth find joy and affirmation. Whether it's through the unconditional support of chosen families, the understanding of healthcare providers, or the sanctuary of LGBTQ plus spaces, these sources of support are lifelines, affirming their identities and fostering resilience. But this journey is not without its obstacles. Misgendering, whether intentional or not, and the struggle to access affirming medical care are realities many face. Yet despite these barriers, the drive to live authentically pushes, pushes many to find pathways to transition each story unique in its challenges and triumphs. So to our panelists, how do these stories resonate with your experiences or those of the youth you work with? What can we, as a community and society, do better to support transgender and non-binary youth in their journeys? I think healthcare is a huge thing. I've had a lot of issues with healthcare over the years. I've switched so many providers with hormones just because I don't come from a very like affluent, wealthy family. And I feel like a lot of hormone services are very expensive. Um, and it's interesting because I even notice like sometimes the doctors don't even have experiences enough to help you or sometimes they don't even know how to answer the questions that you have that are normal. So I've turned to other people in the community to ask different questions about certain things like pertaining to my HRT. I agree with Taya 100% and especially last year when the new legislation came out that changed how and what kind of providers we could go to. I had been seeing um, a nurse practitioner who I liked for a couple years and all of a sudden everybody's scrambling because now it has to be an, an MD. Um, and I'm, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to get back in care very quickly. Um, but that was a, a moment of real fear. And I can only imagine what youth are feeling when they can't even access anything um, until they're 18 years old. And all of the panic, you know, as a parent myself, I don't frequently work with youth, but as a parent, I think about this stuff all the time. Like if your child comes up and tells you that they think they might be a boy or they might be a girl, or they're not sure or whatever, let them socially try it out. Let them socially transitioning it for young kids. That's all it is. It's changing their names, changing their hair. And if they uh, end up changing their mind or figuring out that's not who they are, there's no harm done. Now they know themselves even better. And it's your job to support them in that. 
But a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know that most kids who are young and that are trans, they don't medically transition. A lot of them right. socially transition. Yeah. Well, that's that's my point. Yeah, yeah. Like you that, said, I'm just agreeing with you. So the latest, yeah, yeah. The latest data, I think, showed maybe there was maybe 4,000 teens on hormone block, blockers back in 2022. Wow. It's such a small number compared to the number of trans yeah. people. And blockers yeah. don't do anything but prevent their body from going through it's something true. that is irreversible. Right. Right. You know, it's it, not completely risk-free, but I right. agree that it's... But it's not, they're not right. actually right. transitioning. They're right. just pausing what's yeah, happening. I, I think a lot of people, like, when... Take, like, Dwayne Wade's daughter. Hmm. When, she, when they came out to, like, oh, like, she's transitioning everybody jumped on oh they letting her get surgery to, and i'm like nobody never said anything about a surgery two that's not your business three is like <laughs> let her socially transition like and it's so crazy like i go through her comments and it'd be so much hate under there and it's actually very scary um me personally especially with the black community it's horrible like it's I've myself like experienced it like dealing with like family or like uh, I've lost a lot of friends um, because they have certain view viewpoints. Like I have friends who are like, um, like one friend told me like, oh yeah, like if I found out like somebody I know like a male like starts dating a trans woman, I'm always think he's gay. Mm -hmm. And I said, so you think I'm a man? And she was like, no, like that's. That's the point, though. You still think of me as a gay man. You, you, it just doesn't. So I just feel like we also have to be a voice. We have to make sure that we are there for them to lean, the youth to lean, to lean on, and like talk to and be able to go to. Because nowadays the world has gotten so bad. Yeah. Like it's horrible. Like these kids are ready to like end it all. Like it's so yeah. bad. And, and who I, can blame them? Yeah. Like. Right. It's miserable here. You know, I come from, uh, my mother is a Nicaraguan immigrant. My father's a Cuban immigrant. We come from a rigid background of culture. We come from a culture steeped and permeated and stained by years of, of conquest and colonization and imperialism. And that social hierarchy that it's set is really the poison. And I think it all boils down to that, particularly communities of color or, or, or Latinx communities, that's really that that poisonous seed, that kernel that we can't seem to rid ourselves of. Because when people look at Zaya, for instance, Wade, what they're really projecting is is all of the social hierarchies and the implications of social roles that they feel people should be filling, depending on the way that they look or the way that they were born. And their anger is coming out in the form of all this vitriol toward a child. But it's really not about that at all, is it? And I think we all should do a, 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 a part to it internalize and reflect on that. And as trans people, what can we do? Well, when I was young, I went to Care Resource. At 23, I started transitioning. I researched, I Googled, which you know some of us didn't right. have. And I found Care Resource. Luckily enough, I got my hormones for what? A dollar and something, $3 a month. It was totally feasible. And this was like 2017, 18. It was almost crazy to think that's a more um, progressive picture than what we're experiencing today in Florida. But as trans people, we can stick together. We can support each other, do what we're doing right now, take on charges under our wings of younger trans folks who may need some guidance. I've done that. Yeah. Also, I want to just uh, comment about sort of uh, the transition process and whether or not surgery and hormones. It's interesting when I was in California, uh, California Kaiser Permanente, which is one of the largest like healthcare um, providers out in California, they actually have a gender expression group now. So in other words, they're specifically saying, hey, it's not just about hormones. It's not just about sort of surgeries. It's about, hey, let's talk about sort of everything from comportment, hair, makeup, exactly what is gender expression. And it's, it's very positive when you see things like that, knowing it may take a while to get to Florida. Sure. <laughs> but it's still, <laughs> it'll get here eventually. It will get here. 100%. I find one of the big perils is, you know, we're in a world with these binaries. And as a trans woman, I'm out and proud, and this is me, and I feel like I don't want to have to fit into a binary. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of trans people were forced to fit into yeah. that, but why should we? Mm -hmm. We shouldn't have to. You know, be your own expression of, you know, the spectrum of the rainbow. Mm -hmm. So we're really faced with a lot of pressure mm -hmm. um, if you don't look or act the part. Yeah. Um, 
that creates a problem, but a problem for who? Not for me, yeah. Yeah. not for anybody else, right? Yeah, so, personally, I've, I've met people and my friends and even myself sometimes when you start to transition or you realize you know, how you actually want to be seen, you kind of go too far, not too far, but you lean hard into like your, you know, um, it's like maybe you act more macho or whatever. And then as you start to feel more settled in who you are, you realize, oh, no, I can paint my nails or I can do, yeah. you know, wear earrings or whatever. And it's exactly we and I know historically I wasn't there, you know, but um, mm -hmm. for many years, I believe doctors required people to affirm that they were going to be in so-called straight relationships in order to transition. Like mm -hmm. if you were going to be, a, you know, a trans woman, you <laughs> had to be dating a man mm -hmm. and vice versa. And mm -hmm. like that was a condition, that conformity, even when we're doing something so radical as completely breaking the narrative and breaking the binary, they're still trying to force us into that box. 100%. You know, it's yeah. even interesting. I even find that. So before living in Miami, I'm from a very small town in Florida. I was always the only trans person and it was just, <sighs> I, I felt like I had to be extra, like, feminine all the time. I had to never leave home without my makeup. So, like, I'm relating to that a lot because, you know, it wasn't it wasn't safe for me at all. I mean, I come from a place where, like, you would get your car keyed and your tires slashed if you have a rainbow flag on your car. So, it's very interesting hearing that because I definitely relate to that. And especially, I think it heightens if you live in an area that there's not as many trans people. When I was uh, when I was twelve, my brother outed me, and so then I had to deal with sort of that from you like a small community, religious community, um, had to deal with a lot of abuse, you know, mostly verbal abuse and mm -hmm. bullying. So it's it's sad that some of that still happens today. You know that that it exists. Part of me thinks, you know, and I've always said this, I don't know if it's pessimism, I don't know if it's part nihilism, I really don't, or whether I'm just a realist. And I think we belong to a super minority of people. We will always belong to a super minority of people. Those of us who have even further marginalizing identities, you know, that will always be true. And no matter the work that we do in the world, the, the very proportional reality of who we are will always make put us at odds with the larger narrative of normalcy. Is how I've always seen it. And so what we can do is just prepare for that life and prepare ourselves and the generation of folks who come after us for those lives as well. And, and understand that things may move up and down, sideways, you know, but uh, tra being trans is being trans. And yeah. there is something unchangeable about it, too, that I'm proud of, too.